Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Living in the West. Uh, this is a, a series of programs that we're presenting to you regarding the Muslims who are living in the West, the minority of Muslims. We've been speaking uh, in the past about their situation. Are they actually allowed to live in the West? Uh, what their aims are in living in the West? We're going to go through some of these. Um, I have with me today Sheikh Haytham Al Haddad, who's from the Muslim Research and Development Foundation. Uh, this is an organization and a think tank which looks into providing solutions for this mass. Of Muslims. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shaykh, in previous episodes, we've gone through the permissibility of living in the West. Uh, many people who disagree with the permissibility uh, quote a series of ayahs of Gunfani Surah Nisa, and I want to quote these to you so you can explain this to us uh, a bit clearly. Uh, Ayah 97, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily, as for those whom the angels take in death while they are wronging themselves, now that's, that's they stayed amongst the disbelievers, even though emigration was obligatory for them. They, the angels, say to them, in what condition were you? And they reply, we were weak and oppressed on the earth. And they, the angels, reply to them, Sheikh, was not the earth of Allah expand spacious enough for you to emigrate therein? Such men will find their abode in the hell. What an evil destination. And the next ayah, says, except the weak ones amongst them, men, women and children, who cannot devise a plan, nor are they able to direct their way. And the last ayah in this series of ayahs is, for these there is hope that Allah will forgive them, and Allah is oft pardoning, oft forgiving. What do we say to people who quote these ayahs uh, in saying that it's virtually obligatory upon you to leave the lands of the non-Muslims and emigrate to the lands of the Muslims? Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> If we look to this ayah, okay, mm -hmm. we will see that this ayah mentioned the conditions that we have mentioned before, okay? And see, in this ayah, in the beginning of this ayah, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ تَوَفَّاهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ ظَالِمِي أَنفُسِهِمْ Those whom the angels are take in death, mm -hmm. while they are, what, wronging themselves. Mm -hmm. They are in a state that they are wronging themselves. This is one thing. Then the ayah goes on to say, Alam takun ardullahi wasya. The land of Allah Jalla wa ala, is so spacious for you to what? To go to. Mm -hmm. So here are the two conditions that they are unable to manifest their religion and they have somewhere to go. Remember when we started this discussion mm -hmm. and we said before giving the ruling, we have to explore all possible solutions. Mm -hmm. Whether there is a land or there is a country that might endorse those Muslims or not. Alam takun ardullahi wasi'a means the land of Allah is not spacious enough for you to come. So if there is no ard, Wasia, no spacious land, no country to endorse them, then what will be the ruling? That's why in the ayah, Allah Jalla wa Ala gave an exception. إِلَّا الْمُسْتَضَعْفِينَ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ وَالنِّسَاءِ وَالْوِلْدَانِ Except those who were oppressed mm -hmm. and those who are weak from men, women and children. Those who cannot travel, then they have an exception and they have an excuse as the ayah mentioned. الَّذِينَ لَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ حِلَةً وَلَا يَهْتَدُونَ سَبِيلًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ عَسَى اللَّهُ أَنْ يَتُوبَ عَلَيْهِمْ Those who do not have, those who cannot devise a plan to go to elsewhere to manifest their religion, then Allah Jalla wa'ala may forgive them. And hence, this means that those people are unable to find a proper place to go to where they can manifest their religion. This is one thing. The other thing, 
the ayah said wronging themselves means they are unable to manifest their religion. So the ayah actually mentioned those two conditions. And as we said, okay, as we said that there are, and Ibn al-Qayyim, uh, sorry, Ibn Qudama in al-Mughni, he mentioned these cl classifications. The three or the two main classifications that we have mentioned before and in between. Mm -hmm. The first one is those who are unable to manifest their religion and they can travel elsewhere. This is, the ayah is talking about this okay. okay, type of people. On the other hand, the other type of people, those who can manifest their religion and have nowhere to go, then, of course, for those people, they are allowed to stay in the country. Now, in a non-Muslim country. Now, for those in between, those who cannot manifest their religion and they are unable to travel Elsewhere, the ayah is talking about them. إِلَّا الْمُسْتَضَعْفِينَ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ وَالنِّسَاءِ وَالْوُلْدَانِ الَّذِينَ لَا يَسْتَطِيعُونَ حِيرَةً وَلَا يَهْتَدُونَ السَّبِيلًا فَأُولَئِكَ أَسَى اللَّهُ أَنْ يَتُوبَ عَلَيْهِمْ Means those, except for those men, women, children who cannot travel, who cannot devise a plan to get rid of that situation, then they are exempted from this and Allah Jalla Ala may forgive them. Now, you might ask about the fourth category. Mm -hmm. The fourth category, which is what? Those who can manifest their religion mm -hmm. and... Are able to leave. Are able to leave. Mm -hmm. But here, we say that they are able to manifest their religion. They are able to manifest their religion. So, the manifestation of the religion and ability to identify, uh, to preserve their identity is there. So, they don't fear for their religion. Mm -hmm. So why to ask them to leave while they cannot, uh, while they are able to manifest their religion and they are not committing the major haram. Not only that, but their presence in mm -hmm. non-Muslim countries and maybe in a future episode we will be giving some examples of some of those Muslims who live in non-Muslim countries in the past, such as Naim al Naham and Abdullah uh, and uh, the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Al Abbas and some other examples. For, so for those people, their presence in non-Muslim countries, while they are able to manifest their religion, there is a maslaha behind it. And normally those people are involved in da'wah or at least by manifesting their religion in a non-Muslim sphere, in a, in a non-Muslim country, in a public sphere, itself is considered to be an indirect da'wah. Okay, so now uh, we've clarified this point now. So you, now you're using these, these ayahs explained to us about the type of person. Um, and uh, the concept that you came forward with now is it's, it may be recommended or highly um, it may be better for society in general that those people stay within the society because they can manifest their religion. Yeah. Um, what about the situation of hijra now? Because this is what we're speaking about. Because you're speaking about Allah's land here. What about, and it's a very side topic, but it's something we just pointed. Uh, why is hijra always seen as moving from one Muslim land to another? Not from, say, one place where you can practice your deen well to a place you can practice it better. Where does this classification come in? Because they will say to you, well, I can leave from a land where I practice in Islam to a better land where I can practice my Islam better. Or I can at least go and do certain things which I'm not able to do in this country. Then where do we, where, where do we start? Okay. I think here, uh, Brother Jamil, maybe you are referring to a very famous fatwa mm -hmm. okay, by Sheikh Albani. Mm -hmm. uh, rahimahullah. And Sheikh Albani has two fatwas, two known, well-known fatwas in this sphere, okay? Mm -hmm. One of it, we don't want to discuss it, uh, to discuss it because it's a very controversial fatwa and um, he received so many criticism, okay, about uh, this fatwa when he said that Muslims living, Palestinians living in Palestine, uh, living in so-called Israel because they are unable to manifest their religion in certain spheres should leave Israel, what is known as Israel, 
should leave Palestine to other Muslim countries. And then many people criticize him and they said or criticize this fatwa. They are saying that if Muslims evacuate Palestine, then okay, the land will be empty of Muslims and will be empty of those people marching for their rights, etc., etc. We don't want to discuss this. But the other part of, of this fatwa, uh, which is an, again a well-known fatwa by Sheikh Albani, which does make sense if from a pure technical point of view, not from a, tech, a contextual point of view. Okay, this is he said exactly what you said, that if you are able to manifest, if you are able to manifest your religion in some Muslim countries, but there are some other Muslim countries where you, cannot, where you can manifest your religion in a better way, and you can do more things, then it is obligatory upon you to move to that country. But from a, tech, a contextual point of view, the reality is other Muslim countries will not allow you to do so. I don't want to quote some countries because of the sensitivity of the situation. But imagine that, okay, just simply, can we allow, ask all Muslims to live in Mecca? No, of course not. From a practical no. point of view, some people might say, well, living in Mecca, living next to Haram, and we will be able to do tawaf, we will not be able to do tawaf if we are living in Pakistan or living in Syria or in Egypt. Uh, we are allowed to do this. Um, we are, can we say that all Muslims from all over the place, from Malaysia, to leave their country and to go to some Arab countries because they will be able to speak Arabic, they will be able to practice some other aspects of their religion? No. That is not true from a practical point of view. This is one thing. The other thing, the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, moved to where? Moved to different places. Mm -hmm. You know, we find the Sahaba, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he lived in Iraq. And Abu Hanifa took the fiqh of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, etc. We find some Sahaba left to Yemen. We, some, we find some Sahaba left to Oman and to Egypt and some other places in order to teach them Islam. So those Muslim countries like Iraq, um, like Iraq at that time, Yemen, etc., there were Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. But Islam in Medina and Mecca at that time was better than those countries, was better than Islam in Iraq, in Egypt, in other places. But the job and the obligation of spreading Islam, mm -hmm. this factor has to be taken into consideration, and hence you cannot take that legal maxim in a very abstracted way, okay. saying that, yes, here you can uh, preserve your religion and you can practice your religion, but here you can practice more of your religion, so you have to go to that country. Okay, Jazakallah khair. We're going to take a short break now. We're going to look more into this uh, topic of permissibility of living in the West. Uh, we're going to take a short break, return in a couple of minutes. Please do stay with us on Living in the West. Back to the Prophet. Join Sheikh Amar in the program Back to the Prophet, wherein he teaches us practical lessons from the Prophet's life and how this can help us to overcome our challenges in the present. We talk about the life example of the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, seeking guidance for ourselves. In the early days after the revelation of the Holy Quran, the Muslims were greatly persecuted, so much so that quite a few Muslims had to leave Arabia and migrate to Africa to live among Ahl Kitab, Christian people who followed the Gospel of Christ.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Living in the West. Sheikh, just before the break, we looked uh, about, or we spoke about a certain group of people um, who are able to move and why they cannot move or why they shouldn't move. But when we spoke about people being able to manifest their deen, and you explained clearly that many people are allowed to manifest, and if they are, then there's not an obligation upon them to leave, especially following this ayah of Quran from Surah Nisa. Um, what about the ability okay, of, to abstain from major haram, major sins? Isn't this also part of the manifestation? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, yes, this is part of uh, manifestation. Mm-hmm. And as we said, as we hinted before, that manifestation of the religion is mainly concentrating or focused on manifesting the main mm-hmm. pillars of al-Islam. Mm-hmm. Now, abstaining from haram is also part of manifestation. That's why in hadith, uh, Naim al nahab he is one of the Sahaba, he mm-hmm. did not report many of the ahadith. And Naim al nahab he has a very um, interesting story. We mm-hmm. might elaborate on this story uh, later on. And his um, story mentioned in some of the books of Asira, and we will not take fiqh uh, will not take many aspects of fiqh from this story alone. But this story can be an indication that uh, for what we are trying to achieve. Naeem al-Naham, he used to sponsor some of the poor uh, young girls. Mm-hmm. And he accepted Islam. In some, of the, yani, um, in some of the reports, they said that he accepted, he is one of the very early people to accept Islam. He accepted Islam before Umar ibn al-Khattab, and he was among the first ten people to accept Islam. Mm-hmm. Naim al Naham, his people told him, Ya Naim, stay with us and practice your religion. Because he was in a leadership position, and he was among the elite, And he used to sponsor, he was uh, a rich person, and he used to sponsor some of the poor people in his uh, so-called country, in Mm. his society. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Naeem, aqim al-salaa wahjur su. Pray, which at that time, prayer was the main pillar of al-Islam. You know that zakah was made obligatory when in Medina and some narration said that zakah was made obligatory in the second year of Al-Hijrah some other narrations in the sixth year some other narrations in the ninth year of Mm -hmm. Al-Hijrah but definitely zakah was not made obligatory during the time of Mecca Mm -hmm. Uh, Salah, uh, sorry fasting, Mm -hmm. you know that fasting was made obligatory in the second year of Al-Hijrah so during the time of Mecca when Naeem accepted Islam, Salah was the main pillar. The Prophet Sallallahu said to Naeem, Ya Naeem, establish the prayer and do the good and abstain from evil. So abstention from evil is considered to be part of manifestation the religion. Mm-hmm. However, abstaining from evil is little bit uh, delicate issue. Why? Because Manifesting your religion, practicing, performing the five obligations is something within your control. Mm. Abstaining from haram, part of it is within your control, part of it is from the societal control. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? It means that you can abstain yourself from committing the haram, but the haram is somewhere give, else give an example around of this, yeah. you. For example, a sister, a woman, a Muslim woman, forced to leave her hijab. Okay? This is, it comprises two things. Manifesting her religion and abstaining from haram. Mm -hmm. Abstaining from taking off her hijab. Now, she might be able to manifest that. means she is able to uh, practice hijab on a public sphere. Mm -hmm. That is what is required. But for the other parts of the society, not wearing hijab 
and they are committing this haram, we find that this is unfortunately spread in many Muslim countries. Therefore, you cannot rely on that as a condition for the permissibility of living in a non-Muslim country. Another very clear example. We mentioned the example of people in Andalusia, in some parts of Andalusia, mm -hmm. in the uh, in the eleventh eleventh century. Mm -hmm. They were forced to give their daughters in marriage for non-Muslims. They were forced to eat pork. Mm -hmm. These are typical examples of what un being unable to manifest your your religion or being unable to abstain from haram. So if the person is able by himself mm -hmm. and from a societal point mm -hmm. of view to abstain from these major sins, then that is considered to be the minimum required requirement for what manifesting your religion. Okay, so that's now cleared up regarding the manifestation on that side. Um, but one point which is still uh, needs to be say, clarified is that uh, the picture that you paint here, Sheikh, is not applicable on everybody generally. Aren't there some parts of society who require specific rulings to their situation? Or is this a general ruling now? Uh, I agree with you that, see, different or individual cases mm -hmm. uh, should be taken in uh, the merit of each case. We should not be confused because some people might take those individual cases and generalize them. Okay. And some people even take the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu That I am free from every Muslim who lives among the disbelievers. He should not see their fire. This hadith, first of all, some scholars say that it is an authentic hadith. Some scholars say that it is a weak hadith. Even if we say that this hadith is an authentic hadith, what does the hadith mean? The hadith was talking about a specific situation, although the specific situation can be generalized, but it helps us to understand the meaning of bari'un, okay. min muslimin. This is, yani, there was a battle between the Muslims and the non-Muslims. During the time of the Prophet Sallallahu a few Muslims, they moved to the camp of the non-Muslims because, or they were living in the camp of non-Muslims because they have some relatives, etc. The Muslims killed them. Mm -hmm. They never thought that they are Muslims. Now, if a Muslim kills a Muslim by mistake, he owes him or his family what? The blood money, mm -hmm. the diya. Okay, this the either to be paid by himself or by his male relatives or by Bayt al mm. Now, the Prophet وسلم, said, no, I am free, means I have no liability towards those Muslims who lived with the non-Muslims, okay, who are in a state of war with Muslims, and the Muslims killed them. I have no financial liability towards them means I cannot pay, I cannot be liable for their blood money. That is the meaning of the hadith. Now, individual cases, for example, a person is saying that, well, it's difficult for, I have a daughter, and mm -hmm. it's difficult for me to teach my daughter to observe hijab, and I want to move to a Muslim country where she can observe hijab. This is a big topic and is a very important topic because from a practical point of view, many people are bringing this into the light. Mm. And here I would like to advise all my brothers and sisters that if you are giving this example or giving any other example, in many cases you want a scapegoat. Many Muslims want a scapegoat just to free themselves from being blamed. And whatever, and in many non-Muslim countries, if you put an effort to manifest your religion, even if you put effort to teach your children Islam, you can do so. 
On the other side, many Muslims, many Muslims move from non-Muslim countries to some Muslim countries and they think that by moving to a Muslim country their situation will become better automatically. The situation of their children become better automatically. They fool themselves. Maybe you know, I know, many people know, the uh, audience know that there were some Muslims who moved from some non-Muslim countries to Muslim countries and they haven't taken care of themselves. They haven't taken care of their children and their children were lost, were in Muslim countries, not in, an, in non-Muslim countries. Yes, some Muslims might do well in Muslim countries, but again, the point that we have mentioned earlier that those Muslim countries they are not endorsing you forever they might they will ask you because of the legal situation they might ask you to leave them okay shortly they might ask your children to leave their children might not have universities mm -hmm. so from a practical point of view sooner or later you are going to send your children to receive the higher education back home, I mean, in the non-Muslim country. So that has to be taken into consideration. Okay, well, Sheikh Hatim Haddad, Jazakallah Khair for your comments today. Very interesting comments regarding Muslims living in the West. I'm sure you've got many questions to ask. If you do have questions regarding this episode of Living in the West, you could always send us an email, Living in the West, at huda.tv, where we can answer some of those questions and even pass them on to the Sheikh. Until the next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm-hmm.